All right, 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to 17 through 21. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? <laughs> and he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal mm. and the 400 prophets of Esherah, who eat at, Je at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. Mm. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Holy Spirit, I need help to communicate what you spoke to me. So I'm praying that you'll anoint my lips to speak your word, but anoint their minds to hear it and receive it and apply it. We ask for this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Messiah. Amen? When you look at this, there's a big conflict going on in the world right now. You see the conflict in Gaza. You have Hamas that on a daily basis shoot these rockets into civilian territory in Israel trying to kill innocent people. And now you've got Israel retaliating and even declaring that they're marching in uh, with foot soldiers and tanks to try to, to squelch the attacks. And yet most of the world is opposed against Israel. In fact, if you look at public opinion right now worldwide, they're condemning Israel for defending themselves. They're condemning Israel for going in and trying to kill uh, and destroy and, and stop the rockets that come over. Can you imagine that if we had the same problem here in Las Vegas? Imagine if we had a foreign country right next door shooting rockets over, killing innocent people on a daily basis. Don't you think that we'd do something about it? But if you look at public opinion, most of the world is against Israel. It's a a big conflict right now. When you look at this situation, there's a big conflict between the commandments of God and a, a social or a secular point of view. There's the world standards versus God's standards. And the Bible says here, he says, you falter between two opinions. If the Lord is God, then serve him and follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. My question for you this morning is it's time to rebuild your altar. There's three types of altar. There's the personal altar, there's a private altar, and then there's a public altar. But I believe that if ever there's been a time to rebuild the altars, it's right now. And we start by asking this question, who are you following? I've got five questions to help you decide who you're following right now. Because maybe you're following Baal and you don't even know it. Or maybe you're following the Lord. Number one, where do you spend your money and where do you invest your money? Because the Bible says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. That'll tell you who you're following. Where do you spend and invest your time? That'll tell you where you're, 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 who you're following or what you're following. Because if you're, if you're, a, 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 if you're into to gambling and you're into drinking and, and picking up men or women, then, then you're going to spend your time doing that. You're going to spend your energy doing that. Where do you spend your energy? Where do you spend your passions? The fifth question is, what is the focus of your appetites? They say that the pornography is a multi-billion dollar addiction. They say that uh, drugs and alcohol, pills, uh, all types of crack cocaine, these are all addictions that control people's lives. What's your passion? What is your passion? Because show me your time, show me your energy, show me your passions, show me your appetites, and I'll show you who your God is. Today is a good time to stop faltering. Because the Lord spoke to me, he says, Paul, there's treacherous times that are coming. You think 2008 had treacherous times. We're walking in, I think, to a point where treachery is going to be a main theme in the world. He told me this this morning at about 4 a.m. When Denise woke up, she woke me up too, and I started praying. And he said, Paul, tell everyone to get information. Now, information means this, and I want a couple of volunteers to quickly uh, come up. Maybe about here, about five, ten of you. Come on up here, if you would. Information does not mean information here. It means getting information. So we're going to do this. See, we can, all, we can all march, but if we're not in formation, we'll get into trouble. We'll get into situations, and we will, the landmines of life will, 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 will hurt us. So we want to get information. So Marie, get in front of Pastor Joel. Sam, you get in front of Johnny. And come on over here, you get in front of Sammy. That's, we need one more just to make a beautiful compliment. Come on, here we go. 
Oh, fantastic. Now, this is in formation, Elsa. Elsa just got in formation. Now, we could have been scattered through the world here or scattered through the sanctuary, but when you get in line here, now let's march in formation. The Lord says, get in formation and begin to march. See, you're going to begin to march. Why? Because we're going to take new territory. How many of you want to take new territory this year? You say, I want to take new territory. How many want to make progress this year? Personally, financially, relationally. How about emotionally, psychologically, spiritually? We all want to make, right? We want to go forward. So we have to do it in formation because these are treacherous times. Give these folks a big hand. They're awesome. Come on. Now, so I thought about this as the Lord was speaking to me, and I said, Lord, what does this have to do with altars? If you've been wavering between following Baal and following the Lord, today is your day that you can decide, from this day on, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ like never before. In fact, the Bible says there's only one situation that gets, makes God sick. How many know that God gets sick? He said, the only time it's found in Revelation is he says, I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Biblically, the only time that God gets sick is when Christians are not on fire for him. And we're, we're faltering, we're wavering between two opinions. Whose opinion are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the world's opinion or God's opinion? So these questions should help you because at times like these, a true believer will do what? He's going to begin to repair his personal his private, and his public altar. A personal altar speaks of a daily intimacy. A private altar speaks of what you do behind your, your doors, what you do with your, per, your, your intimate family, whether you have personal devotions, whether you pray with your family, whether you're a good witness, or whether behind these doors you leave a compromising lifestyle. And then your public persona or your public altar is what you tell other people and what you're living out in public. I'd like you to read these next verses because it's going to really help make this point on how we can begin to repair replace or place in our personal, private, and public altars. Verse 29 through 31. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Now these are the false prophets of Baal and Asherah. Keep going, please. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Stop right there. The next thing I saw is I started taking a closer look at the word. Because for me to understand what it means to build a public, private, and personal altar, I have to understand what the Bible teaches. So write these things down. Elijah's altar was public. Notice what he says. He says, Ahab, call everybody in. First of all, Ahab says, you're the troubler. People are saying we're trying to cause problems because we're trying to build a prayer tower on Prayer Mountain. People are saying, oh, you guys are troublemakers, you Christians, trying to build a prayer tower? My goodness. They call us troublemakers. They called them troublemakers in Corinth. They called them troublemakers in Ephesus. I'm telling you right now, friends, we're at a point right now where you've got to dis decide if you're going to waver, continue to waver between following God 100% or following the Lord. I want to tell you, or following the world, I should say, you've got to decide. Elijah's decision was public. That's what baptism is about next Sunday night. It's a public confession of an internal decision. You've got to make your decision public. There's no such thing as a closet Christian. Unless the rest of your friends and the rest of your coworkers knows you're a Christian, probably it's because you've become a closet Christian, and that is not even a biblical altar. God wants you to have a public altar. Secondly, Elijah repaired a broken dawn altar. There was once fire there, but there's no more fire. Maybe that's what it is in your life. Maybe you once had fire for God. Maybe you were once 100% committed, but you know deep in your heart that you're not that way anymore. You know deep in your heart that you are not the man of God or woman of God that you once were. Maybe you once had the fire, but it needs to be repaired. I'm speaking to you prophetically right now. This is not even a sermon. It's a prophetic word. Because this is not the type of sermon I usually preach on New Year, the first Sunday of New Year's. But God spoke to me clearly about what we needed to hear today. And I really believe that God wants to help us through troubled times to become conquerors. But we have to start by building an altar. And we have to repair the altars that have been neglected. 
If I were to ask your friends, your coworkers, your children, what kind of altar does this person have? What kind of Christian are they? Do they have a, are they on fire? Are they, are they lukewarm? What, what would your friends, family, coworkers, and children tell me about your personal walk? How deep is it? How strong is it? What would they say to me if I asked them that question? When I was a therapist, it was not uncommon that someone would come into my office and tell me their story. And I say, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, so your, 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 uh, <laughs> your, your wife is the devil's sister. Okay, I understand that. But then you'd bring the wife in, and by the time you heard the wife's story, you were convinced that that guy was the devil's brother. Because you can't, you know what? You can't judge it based on one side of the story. There's always another side of the story. And so when you look at Elijah, you look at someone who's saying, listen, I want to confront the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and Ahab, today's our day. We're going to make this public, and we're going to make it very personal. And we're going to repair this altar that was broken. I got to tell you something, moms and dads. Your children, whatever level of fire you're, you're at, your children will double it, either to the worse or to the better. I'm telling you, that's just biblical. Your grandchildren, this morning, little Luke came up holding on to my wife's hand, and I grabbed little Luke, and I held him in my arms as we prayed, and I asked God to make him a better man than I'm going to be. I said, Lord, make this young man a better man than me. Make him more on fire for me. God, this next two, three, four generations, come on, God, you can do it. I've already lived a great life. I'm 50 years old. You know what? My whole goal is to pass it on to this generation and the next generation and the next generation. That's my goal right now. That's my goal. My goal is to pass it on to you and for you to pass it on to the next generation and then the next generation. Why was it that this altar needed repair? Because someone had neglected to pass it on. Someone had neglected to shift and give it to someone else. The third thing I saw is Elijah took 12 stones. Notice that. Could you read verse 31 again, please, my great son? <laughs> and Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, mm. to whom the word of the Lord had come, mm. saying, Israel shall be your name. Now notice when he's going to build an altar, I want some pictures of some altars if you could put them up there. A biblical altar was much different than any other altar you might see in a church or per perhaps in the Aztec. I think, I'm not sure if that's Aztec or Incas. Um, but when you look at these different altars, a biblical altar was much, much different. It was formed by taking 12 stones and placing them one upon the other. Later on, they received instructions to build one out of bronze. I, I, I believe it was out of bronze, the, the, the brazen altar, as they call it, and that was in the temple courts. And, and so, but as time, I don't think we have a biblical one, uh, but if we could show you that, you'd understand the 12 stones, when God wanted people to build an altar, it was very specific, and it had forms. I've had people tell me, oh, I don't believe in organized churches. Well, friends, then you don't believe in a biblical church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then Ephesians 4.11, he says, oh, he gave some to be apostles and prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Later on is to establish believers. You see, friends, God has a method and a form to what a church should look like. Why do we have church the way we have church here? Because we believe it's biblical and we try to live according to the Word. Why do we worship for 20, 30, 40 minutes every single Sunday morning and Sunday night? Who knows how long we're going to worship tonight? But why do we do that? Because it's biblical. Because we are trying to reestablish a Davidic form of worship. We're going back to what God originally said what worship should be like, what the praise should look like, what the presence should look like. In fact, during the time of David and even during the time when the tent was being moved by uh, Moses and Joshua, they called it not just the tent of tabernacle, they called it the tent of meeting. They were so sure that God would be there, they called it the place where God met us, the tent of meeting. Let's go meet with God at the tent. See, that's why we have church the way we have church here, because we're trying with what the Bible tells us to form a place that is so in tune with the presence of God that anyone on any given day could be healed here, delivered here, given new hope here. Is anybody with me on that? Elijah took 12 stones. The other thing about an altar, a personal, private, and public altar is it's multifaceted. 
I can't say, okay, if you do this one thing, you're going to have a personal, private, public altar. No, there's several things that goes into developing your personal, private, and public altar. Let's talk a little more about that. The next scripture is this. He said, he built the altar in the name of the Lord. Whose name are you building your career in? And what are you building for? What are you going to leave behind for the rest of the world to see? Have you ever thought about that? Are you building for you? Are you building just to get another car? Or are you building just to finally get your own home? Are you building to get a new home? Or what are you building for? What would happen if everyone here and everyone listening today would say, I want to begin to build my life for the Lord? By the time I'm finished my life, I want it to be a life built for God because the only thing built for God will last. Everything will perish. Are you building your kingdom? I was reading a story. I was actually watching a, on, the, on the plane yesterday a his, historical um, description of Nero's golden building. Yeah, anybody ever heard of Nero's golden building? As you know, during the time of Nero was the, when, when part of Rome, a large part of Rome, the inter, center city burned down. Some accused Nero of actually setting fire to it and playing the violin or whatever other instrument while, um, while the city burned. And of course, most people know that he blamed the Christians. And uh, literally what they used to do is take Christians and impale them and then set them on fire for their, their games. And then they feed them to the lions. And this is Nero that did much of the great first persecution came under Nero. But after the fire was set, Nero decides to build a, uh, a palace in the center of Rome. And uh, this palace covered 200 acres. Just to give you a comparison, Buckingham Palace in the center of London covers about 30 to 40 acres. But this palace covered 200 acres in the center of a city. Anybody can relate to that. And what they did is they used new technology on, actually it was called asphalt. How many of you ever heard of asphalt? The Romans were some of the first to use the concept of using brick and asphalt, brick and asphalt, and some of the walls. They discovered this. They rediscovered the uh, palace of, of uh, Nero. About, about the 1500s, they rediscovered it. Because what had happened is when, when Nero killed himself, everybody basically hated him, and they, they covered over the building with dirt and rubble and everything else. This massive building that he spent four years and, and probably hundreds of thousands of workers was destroyed and covered up in a matter of a very, very short period of time. In fact, I was watching a movie the other day with Denise. You know, when it's 31 degrees outside, you don't do very much. And so we went to four movies in three days. And one of the movies we saw was a movie called Valkyrie. Anybody see Valkyrie? It's an interesting movie because it's based on a true story. There was a group near the end of the war in 1944, there was a group of Germans that became disenchanted with the leadership of Hitler. As you know, Hitler uh, was basically running the country into the ground, uh, killing the Jews, killing the gypsies, killing the elderly. Hitler had a plan of extermination, basically, for anyone that didn't meet his quota or his expectations. And what's very, very interesting here in this movie, and I'm not giving the movie away because you all know the story historically, so I'm not going to give you the punchline because everybody who's ever read history knows the punchline. Uh, these guys tried to kill Hitler and and uh, take over the government, and then their plan was to go to uh, the Allies and say, listen, we want a conditional truce. We want peace now, and we'll give you maybe one or two countries and then leave us alone. And probably the Allies in 1944 would have done that. They probably would have signed for a conditional um, surrender. But as history goes, I'm not telling you the movie, but as history goes, people say, Pastor, you always tell us the end of a movie. Okay, we won't do that. But I can tell you history. History says that the, the, the attempt was a failure. That's historical, so I'm not giving away the plot. Uh, we are, I already knew it walking into it. I already knew that it was going to fail. And in 1944, the plot failed. But what's interesting is if the plot had been successful, then Germany would have thrown away the leadership of Hitler and his, some of his, his uh, SS and, and the other Nazis. They would have gone with better leadership. There would have been an allegiance with the Allies, a, a, a resolution, and they probably would have kept their country intact. But 
when the plot failed, what happened is Hitler and his demonic plan ended up leading Germany to basically the brink of, des of destruction. In fact, when Berlin itself was surrounded by the Allies, guess what happened? Hitler finally took his own life. Now, history tells us that after he took his life, of course, the, the war was already lo long lost. Now there was no longer a conditional surrender. There was an unconditional surrender. Now, I want to give you good news. Today, you can, you can surrender to Jesus Christ. You can say, I'm going to stop wavering between the world standards and God. I, today, I'm going to surrender completely to Jesus Christ. From this day on, I'm going to be a Christian personally, publicly, and privately. I will be a strong Christian. You can decide that today. Because things are going to get even more worse right now in the world than they are right now. So you might as well make up your mind who you're going to follow. Now, the other option you have is you keep fighting your own fight, and then eventually it could be an unconditional surrender. Let me tell you what happened to the Germans after they unconditionally surrendered. Germany was split in two. The Russians had been coming from the north and the, and the northeast. They basically took the east side of, of Germany and all the other countries that had been conquered, and the west, western allies took the west of Berlin and the rest of western Germany and became east Germany, which was communist, and west Germany, which was, uh, was democratic. <clears throat> if anybody knows the story, the Russian troops were allowed two days to plunder, rape, and pillage all the German women and their children. And so for two days, the troops were said, were told, go ahead and do whatever you want to these people because blah, blah, blah. And so that's what happened. But the two days turned into two weeks. And for two weeks, these Russian troops raped, pillaged, molested little children, and did hor hor atrocities for two full weeks. In fact, the only reason they stopped is, is because the leadership of Russia had to send in other troops, and they started shooting the troops that would not stop raping, killing, pillaging the people. When I was there a couple of years ago, I was there for some meetings, I felt the pain, the 16-year-old pain still there, 60 years. 60 years. Imagine, because many of these women that were little children, molested as a 6-year-old, a 5-year-old, over and over and over and over again. These are now mothers, or these are now grandmothers suffering the pains that had happened to them 60 years ago. And when you walk through the streets of East Berlin like, like, like I did, I can tell you I felt the pain that these people had carried for over 60 years. That's the difference between a conditional surrender and an unconditional surrender. I surrender all. I surrender all. You can either unconditionally surrender to Jesus Christ or it comes a point, I really believe it's almost beyond return, where some people get so eaten up by life, by the time they walk through these doors, they've been crack addicts for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They've had 5, 6, 7 abortions. They've had 3, 4, 5 divorces. Many times before they even get enough strength to rip away from the devil, Hitler's clutches, the devil's clutches, you might say, by the time they get through these doors, they're so devastated, they've almost gone past the door of no return. But by the grace of God. Why don't you surrender today? Why don't today you just say, I'm not going to falter between the world and this. I, from this day on, I'm going to follow Christ. I make my confession. I make my decision. Maybe next Sunday night you get rebaptized as a confession to the whole church saying, from this day on, and we'll be on the internet. Around the world they'll see Bill, Johnny, Mary, Susie getting baptized because you said, I'm going to follow Jesus from this day on. No matter how bad you've been or how much you failed, there's still grace for you. Someone say a big amen to that. Is anybody still with me? That's how you start that altar. I'm not going to preach a long time. I'm going to begin to close it, but I want to give you just a few more points. Number four, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Number five, he made a trench large enough, the Bible says. Could you read verse 32, please? Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seas of seed and he put the the wood in order cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said fill your your water pots with water and pour on it the burnt sacrifice and on the wood it's going to take me some time to develop this so i'm going to give you two last points and then we're going to pray i'll probably throw out a little bit tonight before we lay hands on you tonight, and I'll probably, I'm sure I'm going to go back into this next Sunday. But I want you to get this, this next two points. The fifth point is this. He made a trench large enough. How deep is your faith? 
Colossians, it says that you might know the depth and breadth and height of the love of Christ. It talks about, they used to say that Africa, you know this, they used to say Africa, the faith of Africa is a mile wide and an inch deep. I don't believe that's true anymore. We have some wonderful African people in our church, and their faith, I'm telling you what, is not an inch deep. It's very, very, very deep. Can I tell you what I believe? I believe that the faith of America is about an inch deep and a mile wide. They've never put their roots down. In fact, 60% of Americans say that they're Christians. But if that's true, why is it that prostitution is rampant in America? Why is it that drug addiction is rampant? Why is it that we're killing millions of babies? Why is it that divorce is at 50% uh, percent or more? Why is it the families are being destroyed? Why is the one out of three girls is molested by the age of 16? Why is it the one out of four boys is molested by 16? Why is it if you're living in a country, they say there's 60% Christians? It's because their Christianity is about an inch deep. Is it okay if I preach to you like this on the first day of the year? How deep is your faith? How deep does, do your roots go? Ephesians 4.11 says, so you might be established. God wants you to be rooted in his word and rooted in his love and rooted in his power. I'm not mad at anyone here. I'm mad at what the devil wants to do. And I'm saying that you can become a strong Christian. You can become someone of significance. And you can make it through any treacherous times. Is there anybody still here with me? How committed are you to his word? How committed you, you are to the youth group? How committed you are to women's Bible study and men's Bible study? You want to put your roots down deeper? Don't just come on a Sunday morning. Come Sunday night. Come Wednesday night. Do you watch television more than once a week? Absolutely. Do you work out more than once a week? At, hopefully. You should go to church and get committed and become part of a Bible study, part of prayer meetings, 7 a.m. prayer. I'm there. I'm here almost every single morning. The team's here. I'm here. The team's here usually. I'm telling you right now, it's a time to let your faith go down deeper before in his word, in prayer, in fasting. I'm starting a fast on Tuesday. Why? Because I want to start the year off right. Go deep this year, deeper than you've ever been. And finally this, he put wood in order. This is an amazing, amazing story. I never knew this. And I'll, I want to just close with this. Because when Elijah wanted to build, uh, build a, uh, an altar... He knew biblically how he's supposed to do it. I didn't know this, but there were three levels of wood. The first level was the place where you could place your offering. Now, there's guilt offerings. There were sin offerings. There was um, uh, thank, thank offerings. And what that means is that a, a believer could come on a weekly basis or daily basis or monthly, whatever. They would come and present their sacrificial offering, and then they put that offering on top of the wood, and it would be burned. And that was, a, the Bible says, a sweet aroma to God. Now, the second layer is they would take the embers of the second layer, and that would go in to the, to, to the altar of incense in the holy place. And so the top one would burn the offerings. The center series of wood would be used for the altar of incense. So the coals would be taken, placed into the altar of incense in the holy place. But the third, the deepest level of the wood is called the perpetual fire. Nothing could be placed in it or on it. It was there so the fire would keep burning perpetually forever. It was called the perpetual fire. Kind of like you Christians. Everyone here, you should have a perpetual fire going on in your life. No matter what's happening on the outside, you should always be on fire for God. That should be your daily status, is either you're hot or you're cold. The Bible says, I wish that you're either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. This is the date as we begin the year, the first Sunday, to begin to say, let's stop wavering. Look at your wife, look at your girlfriend, your boyfriend, say, honey, let's not waver anymore. Let's tr truly give ourselves to God this year. Let's get involved in Bible studies. I, there was a, a businessman after first service said, I want to get involved, I want to start serving. And so I said, go to pastor's class, and we're going to find out where you can begin to serve the Lord in ministry. Isn't that wonderful? That's a good thing. You should be asking this question at the beginning of the year. You say, well, God can never use me. When you believe the lie. You want to follow Baal? He'll tell you you're useless. You want to follow Baal? He'll use you and spit you out, and you'll be, have an unconditional surrender to someone that hates you, wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Or you can say, I completely surrender to Jesus Christ. Use me, bless me, and change my life. And he'll close the chapter of your life, whatever that chapter was. Maybe you lost somebody. Maybe you went through the pains of divorce. Maybe you lost your business, and he'll begin a brand new chapter and say, let me begin to write the rest of the story. 
You know, some of you, you've been living Freddy Krueger's life. Some of you, you've been living the nightmare on Elm Street life. Some of you, your life has been one tragedy after another. And I'm telling you, by the power of Jesus, today you can say, I surrender. Jesus, become the author of the rest of my chapters. Hey, listen, at 20, I thought my book was finished. At 20, I was thinking about how to kill myself. I planned. I had a van. I pictured on how I'd kill myself. I was going to drive my van into a pole. I, was, I assume I was going to get drunk or stoned or whatever. And my, I had a plan on how to kill myself because I was a therapist. Later on, I became a therapist, so I found out how to... You know when someone's serious. When they have a plan, they're serious. And I had a plan. And I'm telling you, I knew exactly how I was going to kill myself. So at 20, I thought my book was over. And when I finally said, I surrender... See, if Valkyrie had been successful, Germany would have surrendered and their history would have changed. But it didn't happen that way. Hitler drove them to the bottom of the depth where they had to lose everything. Even to this day, do you know that there's American bases on German soil? Yes. To this day. My uncle was on a base in the 70s called Wiesbaden. So even to this day, they do not govern their own land. We American troops are still there with our American bases. That's because at the time, there was an unconditional surrender. I don't know about you. I'd rather surrender to God. I'd rather say, from now on, I'm not going to follow Baal anymore. I'm not going to follow the world. I'm not going to follow Asherah. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. If you're with me, stand. Come on.